my name is Mac McGinn. I'm a Master's of Architecture student at the School of Architecture, Planning and Landscape at the University of Calgary. I am also a graduate assistant researcher with the Talon Research Project. Talon stands for Teaching and Online Learning Network. Our team is creating an interactive lexicon of resources for online education focused on exploring the challenges, potentials and guidelines around tools and approaches. You can learn more about the Talon Project at taloncloud.ca. I'm joined today with Chris Hans and Eric Christensen, who have generously agreed to be expert voices for Talon. They will be answering a few questions, providing insights into online education from their experiences and perspectives. Thank you, Chris and Eric, for joining me. Why don't we start with introducing yourselves and telling us a little bit about what you do? All right, sounds good. I guess I'll I'll kick it off. But so uh, I've been teaching since 2005 at both Mount Royal and at U of C. Uh, I was counting up my courses the other day, and uh, apparently I'm over 75 courses of which uh, one over one third have been online uh, delivery. And so several years ago, I actually talked to my manager and took courses on both learning and teaching online. And so now we're kind of all thrown into this, but you know, so I've had several years of the uh, online teaching experience. Uh, my day job is that I've co-founded a company called Market Grade, where interdisciplinary consultancy focused on marketing, design, innovation, and strategy. I will continue. So I'm Eric Christensen. Uh, so I'm a, an academic librarian at Mount Royal University, so also in Calgary. Um, prior to being a librarian at Mount Royal, I worked at, after my graduate studies were finished, I, I worked at the University of Alberta's Faculty of Education. So they, they still have a unit that focuses on education technology, online learning, instructional design. So I, I worked there for a couple of years uh, before I went to library at Mount Royal University to become a faculty member. And at Mount Royal, if for those who are not aware, we are a fairly small, just under 10,000 student undergraduate university, and our librarians are instructional librarians. So the most, most of my time is dedicated to library instruction. So uh, the nuts and bolts of search, but also creating good research questions, uh, logically thinking through how to answer research questions, where to find information, the kinds of sources available, all of that stuff. So our team does a huge amount of library instruction sessions. That's primarily what I do, as well as you know the service and scholarship that's uh, required from uh, most faculty members. And then outside of work, you know, long time technology enthusiast, um, computer hardware, uh, software development, stuff like that. Very yeah, interesting. We, Thank you, guys. Yeah, we should probably mention that uh, why the two of us are on is that we actually created a podcast series called EdTech Examined. And so the, uh, it's something that we just started up. And over the course of the summer, we're doing uh, weekly uh, episodes just to help people prepare for COVID-19, uh, you know, remote delivery in the fall. And I have had a chance to uh, listen to your first few episodes, and uh, that's that's the main reason why we really wanted to have you guys on here is your amount of uh, knowledge coming from different perspectives with online learning, the the idea of uh, emergency remote teaching, um, and how you guys are adapting towards it, and what technologies are out there, the best practices, and and how we can kind of move forward to get everybody on the right page and this best step forward. Um, so we do have a list of a few questions here that we would like to uh, ans uh, ask you guys regarding um, the online education and moving towards our talent website for that for educational purposes for everyone. Um, so just to start with, um, what are some of the biggest challenges experienced uh, from you guys when moving towards online teaching or remote teaching? And I, I guess I'll start, but uh, for myself, I I was kind of fortunate, uh, uh, especially when we had to go to emergency remote. Uh, most of my interactions with the students had already been kind of taken care of in uh, March. And the only thing that we had to adapt was the actual final presentations. And so I didn't see much value of going and having students go and present via Zoom and have like multiple people. I mean, you're literally right, reading a script off uh, your computer. So I, I didn't see the value that way. And, you know, there's enough uh, problems that you have in the classroom dealing with technical issues. Now compound that in an online video conference environment. So we just adapted and we decided as a group, but going forward, 
in a short span of time to go and take courses that were supposed to be face to face and now having to go and deliver them online. It certainly does pose a challenge. Uh, you know, it, typically I would say it takes like six to nine months to go and prepare an online course. And even then, you know, like there's this one course that I've been teaching where we have a full team of instructional de designers that we work with and we've evolved over the course of years, you know, iterating. So it's, it's not an easy task. I mean, that's why I kind of um, differentiate and elaborate on there's a one thing when you call it emergency remote delivery, and then there's online teaching. And so with that, it does take a lot more time and care. Um, you also have to think about the assignments, how you're going to go and, uh, you know, based on whatever pedagogical uh, approaches that you're going to be taking. But for myself, like a couple of them, I'll tell you uh, one course that I taught uh, this summer was design thinking, which I had, and it was like kind of off and on. We were supposed to go in person. I didn't know if we had enough enrollment because we went to online delivery and I had to go and figure out how am I going to go and do this in a, in a remote setting. And so took some time. I rejigged some of my exercises and also um, the assignments. And so from there, I started investigating some of the technology that might actually help out. And so some of the things that I came across was some whiteboarding technology, uh, specifically the, the tools that I used was Miro and Mural. Uh, we also used Jamboard a bit. Um, some of the fortunate parts, and I kind of looked at it and took it as an opportunity, I was actually able to go and get guest speakers from all over the world. And so I, instead of limiting myself to just Calgary, now I was able to get somebody from Amsterdam, New York. I had somebody from Kansas City and even uh, down in Silicon Valley uh, as just guest speakers as an extra kind of added bonus. Unfortunately, not all the students could attend, uh, but you know the ones that were able to, it was great. And then we did record the session so they can always go and view it at their sort of uh, leisure or whatever it is uh, according to their schedule. The biggest challenges moving to online. Uh, I'm glad Chris takes the question first because it makes it easier for me to answer. I mean, he makes a good point. There's a big difference between emergency online instruction and preparing for instruction online. So for some context, it's a bit different for me because I'm, I'm a librarian. So I don't teach credit is not my primary thing. I support pro credit programs, which is very different. So my instruction is prepared, but also somewhat reactionary to what the assignments and the objectives are that are laid out in, in, a, in, in the curriculum of a program. So I'm the librarian for psychology, health and physical education, but I also do uh, the liaison work around the collection for uh, health and wellness and our music conservatory. So the, in terms of challenges moving to online instruction, I think, probably less so than a lot of other credit instructors, but uh, certainly some. So where it wasn't a big challenge, I'll start with that, is the creating of online resources. That's kind of my job. I mean, if you Google Eric Christensen MRU, the first page you'll see is my faculty profile and a link to the library guides, which especially if you look at psychology are very extensive. So in my profession, creating online asynchronous learning materials for reuse is very common. Now that being said, it was a big challenge to transition some of the sessions I was planning to do face-to-face -face and transition some of the appointments and the style in which I would do those. So for instance, uh, my library instruction kind of largely went asynchronous with the exception of a dedicated time where people could ask questions. So the challenge there is that it requires a lot more preparation. Now I've done this before because I worked in ed tech and I've worked in remote learning. So I know what to do when there's a problem, but it still requires a large amount of time. So recording very short videos on how I would have walked students through uh, say creating a mind map for a research question, how to break down a research question to its essentials, narrow it, pick it apart. I did a, iPad Pro kind of pen and pencil annotation and then uploaded that to YouTube. So I created a bunch of YouTube videos. That was a huge amount of preparation. Now, not so much in the long run because I can reuse those. And then the other big piece for the classes is the communication because 
when I do synchronous instruction online, I don't do a lecture like a class. I don't try to recreate it. What I have to do is that I have to give students an abundance of materials in advance with very clear instructions of what they should have read, how they sh not how they should have thought about it, but what they should have considered. So here, watch all these videos, go through the process, try to create a mind map to start. I'm going to check in on our live class next Wednesday. I want to see how you're doing and I'm going to answer questions about where you're struggling and then give you guidance to go from there. That sounds really easy, but that requires a huge amount of preparation. So I think that's the biggest challenge, especially in an emergency situation. You are trying to create materials quickly to give enough lead time so people can use them in a thoughtful fashion so then you can follow up. Because if you just say, here's the resources, I'll check in next week, that's not going to work. It's not specific enough. It's like, it's like readings for class. Well, why do readings and face-to-face -face classes not work? Well, they're not guided readings. You haven't given them guided questions where it's like on, on chapter, in chapter six, uh, in the third paragraph, you know, Johnson talks about this concept. Well, you have to have read that to be able to answer that question. It's not possible to kind of work around it. So I think that's the biggest challenge, the creation and the lead time. And then in an emergency situation, you're really under a time crunch if you're trying to do both. Absolutely, very good points. Uh, it's interesting to think about that, that idea of lead time and, and then creating almost like a, a bank, a, a database for yourself and being able to re reuse those resources to not come across those same problems in the future. Um, kind of leading to the next question then, do those present opportunities for each of you in, in terms of digital education? and kind of creating a different type of learning atmosphere compared to what it would be in the classroom? Definitely. I mean, I'll, Chris probably has uh, some things on his mind, so I won't hog the mic. But. So you're not taking it? <laughs> well, I, I can, it's fine. Uh, I, I, think, I think the opportunity, I think, I think there's an opportunity, but also a fear, right? So in, in instruction, um, if you release everything to the world in an online environment, you're kind of giving away your secret sauce, so to speak, if you're a really good instructor. That's, that's the, the impression. But I think the opportunity is that if you take the time to create reusable materials, I mean, that's a cost that's sunk in the beginning, but then uh, earn, it makes, it pays for itself in the long run. So I think it's worth it. But I also would say there's another opportunity, which is that in addition to creating resources that you can reuse, um, if I do a video or a series of videos on how to teach students to think critically about a research question, that's, a very that's actually a very difficult concept. That's not easy to do. It took me a long time as a student to get questions good so I could answer them reasonably in a reasonable time frame and in a space that I've been asked to do in the assignment. That's not easy. So if I do a variety of videos on that, or let's say an audio podcast, Yes, it takes a lot of upfront time to create that. And the opportunity is, is that I can reuse it. However, there's another bigger opportunity, which is that students have a chance to rewatch and re-listen over and over again. And there's a really good chance that next time I see them, they'll understand the concept better and their questions to me, because there's always follow-up questions as an instructor, will be more interesting because if the only questions I ever answered as a librarian, which is, you know, how do I use and or Boolean search in a database, which I'm happy to answer, it would get repetitive. But the better I prepare the students, the more advanced their questions become. And then it's more of a conversation. And I, it's more satisfying because I see their growth. I think that's where having blended in a face-to-face -face environment is a good example. You can come to class, you can get that real-time social interaction, but then there's something to re-watch because concepts are difficult, especially in content heavy disciplines. They require a huge amount of consideration. Um, listen to any philosopher or academic to a podcast. I often have to listen to them more than once. That's why Joe Rogan's interviews are so successful, right? Because they spend time to go into deep conversation. And I think if you can create materials where your students have an opportunity to reconsider a concept multiple times, perhaps from different perspectives. They're gonna to come to class not only more prepared and more engaged, but they're gonna ask much more interesting questions, which I am always thirsty to get. Yeah, and I, funny enough, we just uh, did an interview earlier with a, a professor at the Haskain School of Business, Mohammed Kayani, and he was uh, talking about this exact same thing where we 
don't see the opportunities here. And sure, it's a lot of work to go and prepare that material in advance. But once you do it that one time, you can reuse it over and over. Uh, you know, kind of like what Eric was talking about in terms of the fear. The fear is almost like, okay, well, now I create this and it gets out in the world and who knows now other people can go and use it or maybe students will somehow maybe cheat off of it or something like that. And we talked about this as well. Like, I mean, even with regards to tests or quizzes, um, you know, maybe now you might have to reconsider and maybe make the actual test open book or provide other kind of constraints. Um, I think going back to the, that other question about challenges, um, and if you think about the internet etiquette, um, you know, I think one of the things that I always suggest is to go in, uh, like, let's say if we are gonna have a synchronous session, is have everybody muted so that you don't have other external noise or distractions. Um, it's funny, some of my students have even asked me before when we have like a session, should I have my webcam on? And I leave it up to them. It's it's not mandatory. Uh, I don't want to create a situation where it's, uh, you know, required. And I don't know what your personal situation is at home. There might be a child in the background or that you're taking care of. And so, you know, again, uh, you don't want to be kind of put on the spot. Right. And so some of those things uh, I would probably start off, even when I set up the Zoom session in the first place, I have everybody's mics and uh, webcams turned off by default. And then it's up to them and they can go and make the decision if they want to, if they feel comfortable enough. Because really at the end of the day, I don't know if it adds that much uh, to have everybody's faces in this kind of like, you know, Brady Bunch uh, or maybe like a Hollywood Squares type of setup. <laughs> so, eats up a lot of bandwidth. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, and you never, that, that's a good point with the kind of the netiquette uh, that we were focusing on in this week's newsletter, but it's, uh, you know, the idea of privacy and, and then now you're basically transferred to somebody's home uh, or wherever location they are and, and giving them the opportunity to either deny or accept that video uh, conference and be participating in that way. So um, does that, does that find that the zoom is kind of your, your tool to use because it provides you some of those options or what is your kind of your most used software or tool, I guess, for, for communication or, or um, meeting with people online in an education setting? Well, and it, it varies, right? So like I teach at both Mount Royal and at U of C. At Mount mm -hmm. Royal, we are a Google environment, right? So over there, we have to use Google Meet. And so I've used both Google Meet and then at U of C now we've introduced Zoom. I personally like Zoom better, but there's some people who, like, who just love Google Meet as well. Mm -hmm. There's people who love it? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it does come down to a institution, institutionally approved technologies as far as yeah. that goes as well just for the for, for teaching and stuff because us at you at uh ufc you know we're using zoom all the time now and um they've actually gotten they're they're starting to wean out um and not support adobe presenter and adobe connect meeting um so now they're going to be specifically moving on to the zoom platform um, for all meetings and levels of security yeah. well and i mean even it's funny like at mount royal like, if we wanted to, we could go and use Zoom, but then it adds another little bit of complexity because now it's not something that the institution itself has mandated. So I, ha I would have to use my own account or maybe I use like a free account. And then it's a matter of whether uh, it's going to be accepted by everybody if they feel comfortable. So instead of even dealing with that headache, I just go and use uh, Google Meet. Mm -hmm. And even there, uh, there are certain things that you have to go and set it up in a certain way uh, so that you don't have students record it, right? So you have to go and set up the actual uh, in your calendar and then have that uh, actual um, Google Meet uh, URL created, uh, have it set up so that it actually saves to your Google Drive. Because otherwise what will happen is somebody might press record and then they're trying to record it, but it really it's gonna record on the cloud anyways, right? And then just a matter of going and releasing it to the students who wouldn't be able to make it. But I think from a go-to communication tool standpoint, probably those are the dominant ones are Google Meet and uh, Zoom. I personally, again, I like Zoom. I, I think there's uh, some of the features, like for example, just minor little things, uh, but you can go and call in. You can go and have breakout rooms. 
you can have these virtual backgrounds. So if there is, if your room is a total mess, you can go and change that out. And so these are just some little features that Google Meet doesn't have, even though Google Meet was the original one uh, that uh, kind of web-based, uh, more open access. Yeah, Eric, is there, uh, I know coming from your different perspective um, in uh, for, for educating and, and not doing the credit course and stuff, is there, uh, a software tool that you find is being used more than others? That's pretty broad. I mean, yeah, it is <laughs> yeah, a software tool. I mean, like uh, Chris is quite right. I mean, in terms of um, collaboration, I mean, one of the biggest software tools for video conferencing is whatever our institutionally supported one is. Mm -hmm. However, for what I do, because the sessions are to support a particular assignment and I'm trying to get students to think critically kind of get them, if I was to distill library instruction, I'd, I'd really say it's, it's supporting an existing curriculum, but it's, it's helping people understand what they don't know and then how to go figure that out. Not to say that other people don't do that, but I would say that's, that's primarily what library instruction is for. And, and that's what they talk about in, in library science, right? So in terms of tools that, that facilitate that, uh, we are a Google campus. Um, I have set up Google collaboration docs and put students in groups, even in an online environment. I have pre set that all up for them. So if they have a group project, I said here, I want you to come up with a pitch for what you're going to cover in this presentation or you, what you're going to answer for this research question. I want you to start with something broad, then I want you to narrow it, then I want you to narrow it again and so on and so forth. And you can collaborate in Google Docs. And sometimes I'll, I'll set up Google Suite in a way where it's kind of done like breakout rooms. Uh, so it's all set up for them. They just have to click the link. They can go in and they can do stuff. But there's other tools that do that well too, depending on the privacy level and things like that. So there is one called Padlet. That's, um, again, you can, it's web-based. You can send it with a link. It's really useful because it's kind of like a virtual pin board, right? So you can do things like that. Um, yeah, any sort of virtual collaboration tool where I can put people together and I can get their ideas down because one of the issues in library instruction, if it's not face to face and you're not documenting it, it can be quite ephemeral because it's that kind of that one shot, right? So to try to mitigate some of that, even in a face to face, if I write a bunch of stuff on a whiteboard, I usually try to take a photo of it and I often upload it to the guide or I send it out to the students. So they have something to reflect on. Just like I said, that pre-recorded material, you can reflect mm -hmm. on it, you can listen to it again. So if you're gonna do an hour and a half or maybe even three hours worth of work in either an online or face-to-face -face library session, I think you should have something to show for it that then you can leave with either something accomplished, done on what your assignment is, but also kind of evidence of your collaboration, which is very helpful for the instructor too. So there's a variety mm -hmm. of those things. I think the Google Suite is unparalleled. I have used every uh, virtual pin board app. I've tried, I've tried everything. I, I honest, I try them constantly. And honestly, what I, because they're the these generic tools, which is what we were talking to Muhammad about in our last interview, they can be set up for so many different purposes, whether to be manage a project or to, do, or to kind of integrate ideas and stuff like that. All those collaborative, collaborative online tools are great. I mean, yeah, I can be in a, a small group with students in a project and meet with them as a one-on-one, -on -one, so not a library session. We can all be collaborating on the same doc and talking on audio. That's quite profound. <clears throat> Yeah, even it's funny when I went to Mount Royal, uh, when I came back to teach. So in 2016, I didn't know much about the Google suite because I, I was mostly either Microsoft or Apple. And um, anyways, I, I gave my students an in-class exercise and I saw them, they were working on their computers. I didn't know what they were really working on. And then afterwards, they're like, oh, do you want us to come up to the front and present our slides? And I was a little bit blown away. I'm like, what do you mean? And so then they showed me that they were basically, while they were sitting down on their computers, they were actually creating their presentation. And so it just took things to a, a totally new level where, um, and, you know, again, like uh, the slides or maybe even probably a better example, like the, the Google Sheets is probably not to the same level as like Microsoft Excel, but in terms of collaboration, you're probably okay. You don't need to go and run sophisticated macros or, uh, you know, that kind of uh, high level analysis. 
But I, and actually, funny enough, on a side note, I, I was talking to a student that I mentored years ago, probably about 10 years ago. And then she went and became like high up in uh, ATB. And they actually switched everything over from Microsoft over to the Google suite. And just thinking that, okay, well, these millennials, they're just going to like it. And they actually got pushed back because they're like, okay, well, all these years in school, we had to go and learn Microsoft products. And now you've given us this new suite and Excel is just like crap when it, compared to, uh, I mean, um, uh, the Google Sheets is crap compared to the, the Microsoft mm -hmm. Excel, especially if they need to go and uh, run high level calculations and so on. So anyways, I mean, again, I think at the end of the day, it comes down to a cultural kind of thing. And one of the things I'll tell you, like, so I, uh, like, as I mentioned in that design thinking course, I used a variety of different tools. And one of the pieces of feedback that I uh, got from my students, and I didn't think about it at the time because I was just scrambling to figure out, hey, how am I going to go and deliver this online? But the fact that I used multiple tools, the, the students got overwhelmed. And so now all of a sudden you had like three tools to choose from and we only have so much time and we got a, there's a learning curve for these tools. And so um, it's, it's always something you got to kind of think about. And uh, I mean, I think Mohammed uh, did a, a good job of talking about this this morning as well, uh, just in terms of uh, don't, uh, you know, put in the technology just for the sake of the technology and overdo it. Uh, it should be for a specific purpose. We've also uh, seen that with our talent research that a lot of uh, experts that have, you know, we, we've interviewed and, and they've supplied their voices to us, have stated, you know, like learn the technology that you need or that's the most beneficial for you. And that could be the institutionally approved technologies and then work within those means to try to maximize that availability within that certain resource. And then maybe you branch out in certain courses or certain other topics and use other collaboration boards like Miro or something like that. Um, I think it that's sounds a great like, point. Yeah. Uh, not to interrupt, but I was going to say, I, no, think, I think it makes, I think it makes sense because, you know, there's diminishing marginal returns. I mean, I've tested a lot of tools at a surface level to see what, to get an idea of what their potential is, but I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole unless it offers something really quite profound that's different. So I've taken in my previous position at U of A, I've taken the Google suite and webmaster tools certification. It's probably expired now, but I have done it because I want to maximize what I can get from those. And there's an advantage to working within what you're comfortable and what you know well, because I think constraint breeds a lot of creativity. I've actually given students that challenge. I've said, well, here's a, here's a blank. Can you go out and find, we have to work with Google Docs. So how are we going to turn this into a Gantt chart? or the spreadsheet, or how are we going to do this? Is there an existing template? Can you find a website that expands your ability to use the tools we already have rather than adding constantly new things, right? That's an interesting way of turning it back onto the students and allowing them to kind of explore those technologies and, and understand the availability and limits, I suppose, um, within that technology of what you can actually do. So I, I like that idea of not just, it's all on the instructor to try to create this perfect outline of, of a course and, and material within it, that you can turn it back onto the students and help that discovery process with them. Well, I think it makes it more interesting. I mean, like, obviously the instructor can't be like, here's a tool that I, I, I saw a video on that I've never used and I think it's great and then run with it because they won't be able to provide any support. So you have to know it to a certain level. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I only know it so much. I mean, especially when you give someone a spe specified task, you may yourself have not actually used the tool. Maybe you haven't used Google Docs for project management, but maybe there's a template out there or a strategy. Someone's done a series of blog posts on how to use Google Suite for what you're doing and the students then show me. That's an incredible learning experience. And that's kind of the benefit of open educational practices and things like that, where you're, it's, yes, the instructor has uh, some crystallized knowledge and some tacit knowledge that they are teaching, but there is a back and forth in terms of process. And I think that makes it much more interesting to students. I mean, I told students, I said, you know, I've never thought about that. I think that's brilliant. Can I use that um, to show other students? Cause I think it's so innovative. Uh, that's a huge motivation. Absolutely. I completely agree. Um, so segueing into the kind of next question is discussing your favorite resources um, for teaching online. And it's interesting that, you know, us from Talent Project, we're creating a lexicon of resources that people can use, you know, you guys with your EdTech uh, ed uh, podcast and discussing different resources and providing that information for a lot of other people. Um, 
is there certain other resources that you guys lean on in particular to, to try to find out information or try to troubleshoot, try to find best tips, tricks, things like that? Well, and so, I mean, one thing that, uh, uh, even though I've had several years of teaching online experience, I actually attended sessions at both the Taylor Institute for Teaching and Learning and also at the Academic Development Center at Mount Royal. So between the two institutions, I actually went and pushed myself to go and take, uh, you know, sessions and seminars. And actually, funny enough, in some of them, once the, uh, especially if they asked, like, you know, to introduce yourself, all of a sudden I, I got put on the spot and then I had to go and explain some of the things that I've been doing. Uh, for these sessions. Um, and so, but, you know, again, I, I think one of the things that here uh, in Alberta, uh, more so maybe, maybe even it, it could be a Canadian thing, but I, I find in Alberta, we're very uh, open minded and open hearted that way that we'll go and share stuff. Um, I mean, I, I always uh, kind of look at like, there's that, um, what is it, uh, Kevin Bacon, six degrees of separation. And here it's like quite often, like maybe two or three at the most. Right. And so uh, there's just it's much more of a, like a neighborly kind of thing. You look back um, to uh, there was uh, the Fort Mac fires or prior to that, the flooding here in Calgary, just people will go out in droves to help one another out. And so uh, I always I have this saying, you know, start locally, but act globally. And so that's where uh, I look at some of the stuff that we have locally here. And, you know, there's a lot of resources half of which we probably don't even know exists. Mm -hmm. And so this is our attempt, like even with the, the EdTech exam and podcast is to go and just start here locally, see what we have uh, through our uh, initial network. And then we'll go and, uh, you know, um, assemble that and act in a global manner, given that everybody's faced with this worldwide. And especially with the internet, now you have that potential. Mm -hmm. We took a similar approach with Talon as well, looking at what uh, approved technologies or resources are available within the University of Calgary specifically, documenting that and providing that access to instructors, staff, students, and then branching out internationally, uh, nationally and, and internationally, and finding out what other institutions are using and what kind of resources are out there. Yeah. I, I would agree with Chris as well. I mean, the the... Uh, academic development that takes place. I haven't done it at the University of Calgary, but it has an excellent reputation. Uh, I've done it at University of Alberta through the Academic Development Center at Mount Royal University. So they have fantastic, very uh, wide ranging series on instructional methods. And I am almost certain that teaching online will be the focus for the next year or more to come. So that's one way. We do some things internally at the library at Mount Royal, which is really good. So we have instruction roundtables. We do kind of very informal, low stakes discussions about how, you know, do where we encourage our colleagues to share about what kind of instructional session are you doing? What problem are you trying to solve and how are you carrying it out? And we get feedback. Sometimes people want to borrow from each other. That's really good. I've always followed a lot of listservs. I've cut them down over the years because it, it starts to clog my inbox up, but I've been a long time, or not long time, but interested in iSOTL. So SOTL is the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning. That's kind of a discipline. And iSOTL is the International Society of, of SOTL. So they have some really interesting listservs, of course, going to their conferences, any online things that they provide. Uh, the library network for listservs and online instruction through Carl is pretty good. But I would say that in terms of the tools themselves, the tech tools, like so the instruction strategies, I would get that way. But in terms of the learning about the tools, I actually don't get that from a lot of education sources. I'm more interested in what the tools are and then figuring out how they could be useful in an education context. So that's my, what I can bring to it. But I usually go for, I listen to probably 25 hours of podcasts a week. I have them on and at some point, I don't always listen to all of them, but a lot of them are on productivity, focus, technology, uh, not specifically education. And so I curate this list of things that could be useful, strategies, tools, or otherwise. And then I kind of choose the ones and start investigating what I think may have an educational uh, application. Interesting. It's creating your own kind of resource lists and then and then breaking it down from there. 
Um, well, you know. well, and the reason the reason being is because as Chris and I, Chris alerted to, I mean, there are other ed tech podcasts. Uh, there's a few that are inactive, at least according to my the podcast app. I use the ca- uh, app Overcast, which is very helpful. It tells you, it kind of estimates that something hasn't been posted for a while. It's probably inactive that podcast, which I like. But there's there's not actually a huge number of them. There's education podcasts talk about higher education, but that ed tech organization, we we felt that we could contribute something. So the challenge, that's, we're very proud of that. But the challenge is, is that then if you're one of a niche group, then you have to find out how you bring your expertise through other things that you've learned. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And some other things that, uh, you know, uh, Eric has actually also set up a Google news alert. So anything that comes up ed tech related, we get alerted to that. But I mean, for the most part, I think uh, kind of how Eric has been talking about, uh, there's just, we keep, we're, we both have an interest in technology. So we just come across stuff. I mean, one of the things that I usually start off my day just reading is uh, usually Fast Company. And again, my interests are uh, not only like tech, but I, some of the things that I look at is design, uh, business, uh, if there's anything innovation related, strategy. Uh, and so that I find Fast Company is one of the better uh, publications out there. Uh, so that's kind of my one of my go to's. Great. Thank you guys for sharing uh, some of those resources with us and some of us can uh, start taking a look and seeing what they can do for us as well. Um, so going into our final question here, um, one of my favorites actually, because I feel like it creates a lot of interesting ideas. Uh, is what do you expect higher education to look like in 10 years? Well, I think it's definitely going to be different than what it is, hopefully. And, uh, you know, even it's funny, we were chatting about this earlier about, you know, after, let's say, COVID, everything returns back to normal. I mean, uh, what are some things that might actually stay? And uh, I, I hope it actually changes people's mindsets in terms of, how to structure their courses um, and having some of that flexibility. You know, if something can be recorded, is it the best use of class time? All right. And uh, I think when we first talked, um, Mac, um, and I, I believe it was Martina, yes. I, uh, I, I told you about my typical approach to going and teaching and it's, it's not going and lecturing for like an hour. I mean, people's attention span isn't there. And especially typically, uh, you know, I'm working a full day and then if I'm teaching an evening class for three hours, you almost have to be somewhat entertainer. And so I, I think there's a, from a, you know, in the future, people are going to probably hopefully reevaluate. And I, I think one of the bigger things that even this is a issue beyond uh, even just now COVID, people are going to start questioning the value of higher education in the first place. I mean, Google just recently came out with uh, their own certifications where if you go, and I believe they're giving it out to uh, maybe it was like 100,000 people for free uh, on the basis of a scholarship. So if you have their Google certifications, you can go and get a job based on those certifications. So why would I go and do a, let's say, a computer science degree at the University of Calgary? And so, and, uh, you know, uh, quite often I'll tell you, uh, when I start off my first lecture of any class, I always tell them, what should you be getting out of school? And it comes down to, in my opinion, it's three things. Uh, One is developing your creative thinking, uh, critical analysis uh, kind of skills, because it might be something that, uh, you know, that you're actually, you know, some question is posed to you. And especially in this day and age where I never thought fake news would exist, but now you can go engage for yourself whether that uh, actual uh, topic or, uh, you know, facts are legitimate, right? And so that, that's where, why do we go? I mean, you could probably go to like a technical uh, school or what have you and just spend two years, but that's why you take all these other options. It's to go and develop that critical analysis, critical thinking, that creativity. Uh, I mean, here at the University of Calgary, we're even, uh, we've added another layer of entrepreneurial thinking as well. Right. So, but anyways, uh, it's a matter of if somebody asks you a question, now you can go engage, or if somebody presents something to you, you can go engage based on, you know, your experience in philosophy, humanities, science, business, you know, a whole, whole variety of disciplines. That's why you have to take those 
various years. And those are things that are not going to be replaced by, let's say, artificial intelligence or other technologies, those soft skills. Uh, then beyond that, the second thing that I always say is research skills. So if somebody asks you a question, you may not know the answer, right? But we're going to equip you with the research skills for you to go and figure out for yourselves. And especially with our database of, um, you know, resources that the library usually subscribes to. I mean, they're spending millions of dollars going and trying to get access to all this information. And even for any of the students that are maybe listening to this, they should take full advantage of that access because afterwards in industry, you actually have to pay a crap load of money to go and access those materials. And then the final thing that I always tell them is your actual communication skills. So especially writing, if you, you know, I teach business communications. One of the things in our textbook it mentions is that uh, about 30% of your time is spent writing or communicating in some way. So, you know, and I believe it was something like, you know, if you take like a $60,000 salary, it, that would mean that it would be about $18,000 a year that a company is paying just for you to go and write emails, reports, presentations, whatever. And so that's, again, why do you think you have to go and write these essays or, you know, uh, certain questions or what have you? And so all of those combined together, that's what you're taking away from university. That's, uh, and again, those soft skills, uh, if you look at some of the bigger uh, people who um, maybe don't even uh, have like uh, the technical skills, like uh, I look at a guy like um, uh, Stuart Butterfield from Slack. So what you may not know, he actually has both a bachelor's and a master's in philosophy, right? And you might think, okay, how is this guy? He's a tech founder. And it, this isn't the first time. He actually created Flickr and sold it to Yahoo. That was his first startup. Both times, both Slack and Flickr, they were actually going to be video game concepts that he was trying to develop. And somehow they turned into something else. And, you know, a, a lot of these uh, founders, like you look at like Ben Silverman, who's the founder of Pinterest, again, non-technical founder. And so you might wonder, and the, the, there was even a, something that was written about this where like Silicon Valley uh, tech companies in general, they have stopped getting people that are technical and are looking more for those liberal arts uh, because again, they have those critical analysis, critical thinking skills. They're thinking, as they say, outside the box, they're adding another layer. And especially when you're dealing with users, you got to go and understand some of those aspects. So I think in the future anyways, uh, you know, people, we're going to have to rethink overall what, what value are we taking or g uh, giving away in school. And um, I was fortunate enough, like I have actually, I taught a course uh, this past semester uh, in winter semester at the Taylor Institute for Teaching and Learning. And I'm probably one of the only sessional instructors that it were, had that opportunity. Previously, I was um, uh, asked to be like a guest speaker and, uh, you know, kind of a judge advisor or whatever in the course, but it was a course called Global Challenges. So if you go and search Global Challenges, you, UFC, you'll come across that course. But in that course, uh, I mean, I've seen it now evolve over the last three years. Uh, originally, it was, there was no textbook. It was, how do you feed 10 billion people by the year 2050? That was it. And basically, the, we were going and helping the students develop that uh, inquiry kind of skills, the critical analysis, critical thinking, research, and so on. This year, so uh, this past year, they changed it to the global challenge being water. And so this year, we actually had a book. And so the book was uh, Water 4.0. And uh, I think it probably makes sense. I mean, I don't have a science background, and I found that book really useful, uh, but at least there's a lot of technical aspects to water. And um, I, I remember the first thing that we started off, we had a block week course uh, in January where we had the students come in. We played a Netflix documentary on, um, it was called uh, Explained and it was on the water crisis. And Mexico City is gonna be the first city that is gonna run out of water. And then I think the second one is gonna be Cape Town uh, in South Africa. And again, you know, these are big, problems um, that we're all facing as society. I mean, I didn't know myself, but even though we have all this water, uh, you know, you look at it in the oceans and everything, that water is not usable. And so literally the entire population 
of the world is living off of 1% of the world's water sources. Right. And so it was, it was very interesting. I mean, I wish uh, I could actually have captured a lot of the, the projects and the end deliverables that were uh, presented by the students, because these were all first year students. Uh, you know, they, they were taking this course, which probably maybe isn't even the best to advertise because they don't realize it, but the ones who do take it, they re they find that it's uh, been something that was instrumental in their overall academic career because it, it, it just pushed their boundaries, got them, uh, them to go and start thinking about, um, you know, education and world issues and, and that kind of thing in a different light. And so, uh, again, uh, that's where the Taylor Institute of Teaching and Learning, they're looking at, okay, well, the education sector is going to get disrupted. So how do we go and uh, prevent ourselves from being disrupted? And so this is their experiment of a course where you have no textbook, what are the students going to get out of it value-wise, right? And so, I mean, I was, uh, it was an honor and privilege for myself to actually be involved in that. And I, I know uh, in the future, I think they're actually looking at making it into a 300 level course, because again, when you're fresh into school, you may not even know what is this UNIV 201, what, what does this stand for? Like, is it even going to qualify towards my degree? And so uh, anyways, uh, I, I think we'll see how it goes in the future, but it's, uh, it's very interesting that we're, we here in Calgary are taking this kind of, uh, you know, leading edge approach. Yeah, Chris, Chris's analysis is pretty interesting. I mean, I, I think, I, I would agree with what he said. I mean, I think what he's referring to is similar to what I think, which is that I think universities are, actually going to go back to a state that they were during their inception. So let's think about skills for a second. If you look at the research, uh, I think RBC, so the Royal Bank has done research on, uh, you know, desired skills and outcomes at 21st century skills. It feels like every 10 years, there's a new name attributed to the same set of skills, which I find infuriating to be perfectly honest, which is just, they're all like Chris said, soft skills, communication, uh, logic, uh, critical thinking, and it's very difficult to teach critical thinking. That's, that is a massive challenge, and, and in many ways we don't do a very good job of it. But I think one of the best ways that you do it is by giving people problems to solve, because a problem that you have to solve, particularly as part of a team, outlines two things. Well, first of all, it gives you a goal which is really important. So uh, games and goals and things that make education interesting, they've shown this in K to 12, uh, rather than rot memor or writ memorization and things like that uh, are, are, are much more motivating. So, you know, that's why we've moved to more active learning and stuff like that. But at the same time, if you, you can take all the degrees that you want, but if you're faced with a problem, it's only when then are you really confronted with what you don't know. And you're like, I can't actually solve this until I've learned X. And we do that all the time. I mean, nobody who has a PhD would tell you that, well, I figured out everything I need to know and then I just applied it to my research. No, it's impossible. It doesn't work like that. So I think those soft skills are gonna be increasingly important. They're gonna be problem-based, large problem-based, team-based classes. So you're getting your problem-solving skills, thinking outside the box, plus having to work with other people. So you, you've, you've hit those two. But I think you're also going to see kind of a, a shrinking, perhaps. Uh, I have to be careful how I say this. Uh, a shrinking of the disciplines or a more interdisciplinary approach. And I'm not sure how that's going to work. So I didn't take a specific discipline in my undergrad. I have, a, I have, an, I have an undergraduate arts degree in international relations. So I had to take economics, international trade, um, political philosophy, philosophy of logic, political science, variety of history courses, languages, things like that. And the idea is that you try to use all these skills in tandem to write papers, answer questions, and solve problems. So I think university is going to go more general, more interdisciplinary, and more problem-based, active-based learning. And I think we're, we're, if you were to look at education as a pie, like a pie chart and to think of where universities, I wouldn't, I don't want to say lose because it's not necessarily a zero sum game, but where they're not maybe going to focus is in the highly, highly specialized areas. So I think places like engineering 
are in good shape because they're basically what I've described, applied sciences, interdisciplinary in many regards. But I think you're going to see a growth in non-accredited micro learning. So LinkedIn learning. LinkedIn bought Linda. LinkedIn was bought by Microsoft. Microsoft owns the largest online learning platform in the world. It is very good. And if you talk to a web developer, somebody who works for Google, somebody who works does their own contracting, I do not believe a computer science degree is a necessity to be very, very successful for a smart person in that field. And like Chris said, it's not solely a technical field. It's, it's not a math field. If you, if you studied the philosophy of logic, you're probably a very good programmer because it's about arguments and consistency. So if you want to be a web developer, yeah, go take a computer science degree. Uh, but I think that curriculum should mandate that people take math and statistics and philosophy. Um, and then they can go get specialized through micro learning. And that's probably outside the academy. I think that's the better investment. Mm -hmm. Interesting that it's uh, <clears throat> kind of getting out of the university state and getting that macro learning and, and picking up skill sets from a variety of different resources instead of just, you know, I'm, I'm going to go take a four year degree. I'm going to get my certificate and then I'm going to go um, hit the world and hit the ground running. So I, fi I feel like that, that learning concept is going to be quite different from, from what I'm hearing from you guys. Well, we should be teaching people as part of their curriculum. I mean, I, I have, these kind of pie in the sky ideas of what I'd like to see education look like. So for instance, if I was in charge of a program, let's say, let's say it's psychology. And this is no reflection on the, the area that I support. Actually, I think Mount Royal psychology program is very good. You would have like Mount Royal, you would have general courses that are supposed to be round out someone, give them well-rounded um, interdisciplinary skills. That's why we have a general education program at Mount Royal. Uh, you have to take math, you have to take statistics, but you have your discipline. Well, a lot of the skills that you get from a psychology degree, political science, history, perhaps biology, there's a lot of writing, presentation, critical thinking, plus perhaps some facts that you just have to know down. But what I think what we should do with programs is that there should be regular interval reflection where people compare themselves, not to others, but to where they were the previous year and figure out how can I translate this general skill into solving a problem in perhaps the workforce. It doesn't have to be a specific position because I think that follow your passion, follow this position is a terrible piece of advice. I think people become passionate because they become good at things. And how can I solve a problem with the skills I have kind of reverses that. And it teaches people to think, oh, if I was to have to explain to an employer what I can give them. That's very, very difficult. If you've just been in academic mode, any, any, uh, ask any student who's graduated, who's become demoralized because they didn't get a job right away. It's because it, that is a difficult transition in thinking to make. It doesn't mean people can't do it, but I think that we can build that into curriculum to where people leave. They still have to start with something to get more experience, but they're, they're positioned in a way where they can start to say, I, have, I do have skills and here's how I can apply them. And if we built that into the curriculum, we're gonna give people a lot more confidence. Bridging the gap between the education and, and entering the workforce. Yeah, because not everyone's gonna be an academic. Mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. You know, it's interesting. You mentioned that thing about following your passion. So a couple of years ago, I was asked to do the keynote talk at the uh, the Dean's List for Haskane School of Business. And that was one of the things that I mentioned was following your passion. And the, I kind of gave this anecdote. So my uh, business partner, he was actually raised by his grandma. And so she would go and tell him that uh, if you go and chase money, it's like running after your shadow and you'll keep going around in a circle and it might get kind of close and then it'll just fall through your hands. And so instead, she told him to go and follow the sun, the sun being your passion. And then the sunlight actually shines on you. And consequently, the shadow will be cast behind you and the shadow will follow. And so everybody loved it. They ate it up. I, I said the same thing at Mount Royal as well. And I'll tell you, after about a year of reflection, I was wrong to go and say that to people. And I think it's important to, you know, follow your passion, but you should also probably figure out what your superpower is. 
because it, you know, let's say if we were all to follow our passion, especially growing up in Canada, we'd probably all be wanting to be hockey players, right? And I don't know about you guys, but I, I can, I'm not the best skater. I, I don't think I would even had made it to any kind of league. And so, you know, this is where I think it's figuring out what your core strength is and then trying to build upon that. And, you know, uh, I was, it's funny, even my education, it's been a little bit diverse. So I uh, originally was doing a, a BCom and then I just, uh, I ended up doing a double degree. So I actually did a, a BA in political science as well. And so I, I attribute a lot of my kind of thinking uh, to that, like just in terms of how I approach things, um, especially from a consulting strategy standpoint. But you look at in the future, you know, again, uh, getting back to like these next 10 years, all of these companies, I mean, there's this one podcast that I listen to, uh, which has this professor from NYU, uh, Scott Galloway. And he's talking about how all of these big companies like Google, Microsoft, uh, Apple, now they're at over uh, a trillion in valuation to get to that next trillion, they have to go after the big pieces. So what are some of the bigger industries? There's like healthcare, there's education. And guess what? These companies are going in both of them. And so who knows what all the future will entail in, uh, you know, with these big tech companies involved. But I would like to think that some, you know, hopefully we can go and use some of this technology for the betterment. Um, I, I think there could be some really exciting things, especially when we start looking into like AR and VR. Imagine instead, you know, before you would have had to take like a, a field trip out to some place. And now if you can just put on these goggles and uh, be maybe getting like a, uh, a lecture from Socrates or something virtually, you know, and be able mm -hmm. to actually see some of the, the ruins or what have you in Greece or something like that, depending on whatever course you're taking. So, you know, I, I think really at, at the end of it, we got to find um, sort of a, a reason or to go in. I, I still think it's important to have like a higher education. I mean, I was born with, uh, or I was, uh, you know, my parents always told me that a degree is something that nobody can ever take away from you. And That's what I was told too. That's, I, I yes. believe I was told this. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Maybe you mm. <laughs> Did they all go to the same seminar? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So, you know, it's, but at the end of the day, you look at really uh, in a field like computer science, look at like a guy like Zuckerberg, right? He dropped out of Harvard and he has, you know, he's probably one of the richest people in the world and has not even graduated. So really uh, in a lot of ways we're like idealizing and I don't know, it's in business, especially that's where I come from. I'd look at it. I think it's almost like we're so desperate to find a new Steve Jobs that we want to just find some of these people, like whether it's like an Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos, but really, you know, uh, having somebody really rich, there's a, a combination of factors. It isn't just, you know, uh, having like the, the most genius IQ or what have you. It's, uh, it's, it's a lot of times finding the right people at the right time, the right trend comes along. And uh, I don't know about you guys, but I personally, I don't, I look at a lot of these uh, kind of, um, dystopic type of movies and we're kind of heading in that direction where you get a guy like elon and uh, uh jeff who are going and creating space companies i i think i'd feel a lot better if like nasa was actually heading up the space program but it, it just goes to show you like the the innovation wasn't there i mean to go and lose the rockets every time you send up a, a shuttle and it takes a guy like elon to push back and say okay well why don't we reuse this Right. And so this is where I think you kind of have to have some of these people just kind of challenge uh, how we're going about because the same old what's been happening isn't going to go and solve the problems in the future. Right. We have to kind of think outside the box. And uh, I mean, I hate to even use that phrase thinking outside the box, because in a lot of ways, uh, I would say almost like a, going to university uh, you're almost like the box is being put on your head and then you're getting pushed into the world. <laughs> so, but hopefully you've uh, developed some of those well-rounded skills along the process. Well, and if I may add, I know that you probably have a time limit for your interview, but I mean, I, I agree with Chris. And I mean, I think what, what education is supposed to do is it, it's, it's, it's to make people less dependent. It's, it's to empower people to take risk. If you're 22 
and you finished a degree, say it's interdisciplinary, and you're like, yeah, I'm going to go start a business. I, I think I think part of the part of the issue is that that is harder now than it was in say you did a degree in 1965 because of the cost. There's not a lot of risk taking you can do if there's a cost. And I think that that's why we see a vacuum in education. So if his costs in higher education goes up, while well, market forces are gonna come in and they're gonna produce perhaps non-accredited micro learning. And, and if industry starts to say, well, we can't really tell a difference. And I don't think that's true. I, I think that's true for some things. I think that's definitely true for technical skills. Like if you want to be a web developer, it doesn't mean that a computer science degree isn't very valuable. Perhaps it gives you a better foundation and then you have to do kind of additional learning to kind of specialize. But I think that that is a reality. It, university is considerably more expensive. So if you want people to take risks, empower them to think outside the box to do problem solving, uh, you, you have to allow for that. I'd also say uh, kind of to build on on something else that Chris said about uh, I've, now I've lost kind of my train of thought about passion and projects. People should be taking on or we should encourage students to take on projects. And this is perhaps what we can do better. Uh, that is a little there's not impossible to achieve a little bit out of the bounds that they might otherwise recognize. I mean, I'm, we're doing a podcast. I've never done a podcast before. I tweeted it and Chris responded. I really want to do an ad tech podcast. We've never actually met. You know, this is all remote. Now people would say, oh, why would, why would, why would Eric and Chris want to do a good podcast? Well, it does appeal to me because public speaking is not something I'm afraid of. So I get it. I'll, I'll give you that. But it's a new way of communicating that I'm not comfortable with. That requires audio editing. That requires branding, which Chris is much more of an expert on than I am. That requires an idea of a, a scheduling and consistency and gathering a following. I mean, we're learning a huge amount. I mean, I could have taken a course and create your audio empire, but I don't think it would have been as good of a learning experience as doing a project like this. And that requires sacrifice and time. And I think if you build that into curriculum, when people leave the institution, they're more likely to continue taking those risks. People have to be taking risks in class so they can take risks outside when they're done. Absolutely. I think you can see uh, why this is my favorite question. Uh, to start wrapping it up. It, it always takes different forms and, and provides different directions on what people are seeing uh, and the way education and online education will be in the, in the future and going forward. Um, just as we wrap up here, is there any final thoughts, uh, tips or tricks, things along those lines that you guys would uh, like to provide as we kind of conclude this uh, discussion? Uh, I don't know if there's much more. I mean, uh, we'll, <laughs> we did touch on a lot there. We touched on a lot of stuff. I'm sure there probably is. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, it's just a matter of, uh, I mean, getting back to like this net um, uh, etiquette kind of thing, um, especially given that's your focus. Uh, I think it's just, a, you might think it, uh, it just it might even be like common sense, right? But I mean, one of my clients always says common sense isn't very common. And, um, but just, especially in an online environment, I find uh, people are a little bit, it's kind of, you look at like the trolls that are on like Twitter and stuff and other kind of social media platforms, just even having kind of the expectation laid out for your students that uh, we want everybody to be treated with respect and so on. And I mean, that's just standard kind of uh, verbiage that we use in our course outlines um, and just kind of encouraging that as well. Um, and I mean, one other tool, and so we interviewed somebody a, about a week ago, and that podcast is going to be coming out in like two weeks. But I, I think I might have even mentioned to you, Mac, but uh, one of the biggest things when you're going and putting together teams remotely for our students. So we've been using, um, or uh, we interviewed this uh, gentleman who's a professor of psychology at uh, the UFC, and he's developed this system called ITP Metrics. And I, I think it could be hugely beneficial to, for people to go and be able to use that system. Uh, even if it's uh, nothing else, uh, even just for the students themselves to kind of reflect on their own personality and you know, kind of their uh, strengths and weaknesses. Um, but I found that to be very useful. I, I first came across that in the Global Challenges course. And then since then, uh, I actually used it in one of my online courses just as an experiment to see how it would function. And so it was a little bit different this time because I actually had to do it myself. Uh, whereas for the Global Challenges course, our course coordinator actually updated 
and uploaded the the class roster. But yeah, I mean, the, there's probably a crap load of tools out there. But again, like how you mentioned earlier, uh, got to pick and choose. There's only so much that you can do. And uh, maybe even uh, one of the things is given that it is like a short time frame. I mean, now we're going to be down to about a month until the semester starts. You know, just maybe it's good enough. Right? Don't don't get like to this kind of perfectionism kind of standpoint. I mean, even uh, I look at it for ourselves. It's um, it's funny. Maybe it's actually an opportune time for us because now there's no content being developed out there. There's guys like Trevor Noah who actually has increased his following and he's just, you know, uh, broadcasting out of his apartment in New York or what have you. Right. And so now all of a sudden our expectation as a society, let's say if it was going to be like a nine or a 10 for audio visual, now it's at maybe a six or a seven. And so, you know, again, just don't be afraid and just push forward. Right. And uh, I mean, even uh, one episode that I, or uh, something that uh, Eric shared with me and we're thinking about maybe talking about, but how about even creating a podcast for your actual course? And so now you can listen to that instructor and you don't have to, uh, you know, uh, even attend any lectures or what have you. And so this one gentleman, he's actually done this. He has like three hour you know, podcast episodes and he even reads like the textbook, which I, I think that's like overkill. I mean, I, I don't know if I would go and read the book for the students. And, uh, but it, it was kind of cool that some people like, again, this is a new medium. You do it that once. And I, again, I think it's that fear that, okay, I do it this once and now it's out there. Then what happens? I mean, is anybody even going to come to school anymore? Right. But I think that again, that's where I, uh, us as an education industry and sector, and you know, for those of us who are in academia, we got to figure out what our value proposition is and what do we add. I mean, I I always take the approach. I actually tell my students, as far as I'm concerned, I'm just here as a facilitator. I mean, I could go and um, you know rant on for hours on any one subject, but that's not going to add the value. It's whatever the students want, and so I always turn it to them. I'm like, you know you as the students are who, uh, driving the actual course delivery. So if there's somebody who's interested in something, I'm more than happy to go and talk about it. And uh, especially there's, uh, if you look at it, there's people who will pay a lot of money for from a consulting standpoint here and now you just have to pay your tuition and you're getting a degree for it. So even take some of your, if let's say you are starting a business or something and I'll tell you, there have been people who have taken my course just because they wanted to start a business. And now you get access to me and you can ask me questions, uh, just paying your tuition. So, you know, take that uh, opportunity. And I, I think even just as uh, students themselves, they should probably just push through and uh, break out of their comfort zone. And, you know, uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with going and dropping uh, an email to your instructor or professor and, you know, talking to them after class or what have you. I mean, I've, there's quite often, there's been times that I've, uh, I don't even know how the time flies, but after, uh, uh, you know, let's say I do a three hour lecture, all of a sudden I've spoken with a student for like an hour after class, you know, talking about whatever they, uh, you know, issues. So, you know, <laughs> again, you know, this is just something that everybody's going to have their own take and their own approach, but really we just got to be a little bit humble. And, uh, you know, especially now that we're entering into an era where it's online, remote, we're not all comfortable with it. And just to even acknowledge that, that this is all a learning process for all of us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I really quick. I would I would say a couple of things. I would say for students, which I realize that you know Talon has more perhaps an educator audience. I had a I had a great piece of advice as, as an undergraduate student from a faculty member who I'll leave unnamed, but still as someone I greatly respect. He said, "Make a nuisance of yourself. Go ask questions." These are really we're supposed to be we're supposed to be smart people at an institution where there's learning. So to maximize the value, yes, do your assignments, show up to class, do your readings, but ask questions, get to know people. It, it builds not only uh, tacit knowledge that you're not gonna get necessarily out of the class, like Chris said, those discussions can go along, but you're all building a network. 
uh, and you're building potential mentors and it's hugely valuable. That's the biggest thing I ever got at a university. So that's my advice for students. For faculty, there's, there's really three things. As the, the late Christopher Hitchens said, uh, do not let perfection be the enemy of good. So, and I think there's two ways to do that. I mean, my research area, or one of them, is an open education. And part of that is the pedagogy and the practices, meaning being forthright with your students about where you're an expert, what you can bring them, but also being honest when you're trying new things. And if we're on an online environment and you've never taught online or have minimal experience, you should say, here's the best practices I know, but I'm gonna do some experiments. And it's a two way street because I want your feedback because I really value it, but this is what I can tell you that I do know. So not everybody knows everything, if you're honest with students about that and you can you you give them agency to provide feedback but then you've also built leeway for leeway for experimentation in your course and, and new things and i think that's very valuable i would also say or i'd also encourage people who are comfortable but even those who are not universities have really receded from the public eye i talked about earlier i talked about micro learning i talked that it's i think it's coming about because of a vacuum of what universities are not providing. Well, universities used to do a lot more public lecture series, interaction with the public, used to get a lot more news articles where a, um, a real expert on a topic would provide context. You still get that on television news, but that's not the same thing. The public lecture series, there is a deep interest for long form academic discussion on current issues. People are smart. People are interested. Joe Rogan would never be successful doing three hour podcasts with some of the highest cited professors ever if people did not have the attention span more than 10 minutes. Now attention span does matter in a lecture because you're, you're get, like Chris said, we always encourage people to kind of break up videos as much as possible, but that's very different from conversation. So public conversations, public interaction, that back and forth leads itself to a longer discussion that's more interesting than me delivering a lecture to a, an empty vessel or something like that, right? So there's a difference between how we tell people the best practices for lecture versus public debate, public interaction. So I would tell instructors who have something to offer the world, whether it's their open educational practices or their expertise, uh, they should go public. If they can spend even their time, you know, unpaid time doing a podcast, there's some really well-respected academics. Chris pointed out Scott Galloway. I'd also point out Cal Newport, who's a computer scientist at um, a university, Georgetown, I'm going to think. Please fact check that. He wrote some great books about productivity and deep work, and he has a whole podcast about it. He is a public intellectual as well as a university professor, and we need more of those people. As we recede from the public eye, we're going to become less relevant because we're not going to be on people's minds. And I think it's for people who've done cool things, uh, they should be highlighted. And that's what Chris and I are trying to do. That's what you're trying to do. And I think people should uh, be bold and, and be as public as they can about the, the, the unique things that they have to share. Absolutely. Well, as, uh, thank you very, very much for both of you for joining us today. I appreciate it. Uh, the amount of information coming from different perspectives is phenomenal. Uh, I think a lot of people will help, take a lot of value from this. Um, so again, thank you very much, and I hope to be in touch with you guys in the future. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.